Well, good morning, once again. It's still unusual, me preaching to just three guys now instead of two. We've almost uh, doubled our attendance <laughs> by adding one more guy. No, that's a joke. Um, again, we're looking forward to the time that we can reconvene in a normal assembled worship in just a couple of weeks, but until then, the online format has been a blessing to a lot of people. Uh, I know many churches are doing this. In fact, uh, a lot of my preaching brethren are uh, still struggling to try to get the uh, audio and video and streaming together when it comes to, to helping serve the congregation and serve the community. And so we're very thankful for that you are here with us, and we've had a lot of people from the community uh, reach out as well, in case you were not aware, and they've been tuning in and getting a glimpse into what this congregation is like. And so we're thankful for their uh their, their viewing as well. So today, our topic of discussion is going to be the idea of longing for connection. And I can't think of a more apt uh, theme to talk about this week because we are in the process now as a society, as a culture, as a nation, as a state, as a city, to try to begin to think about how to, to stay connected while also beginning the process of opening up the doors to businesses and to churches and to uh, different community events that are going on. Uh, we are trying to, to minimize the damage that can be done through a virus that's very difficult to control and to treat, obviously. And uh, the most pernicious fact is the idea that you can have it and show no symptoms and then spread it to someone who uh, you may not even know that you've given them the virus, and then they are affected in a, in a traumatic way. And so we're trying to do our best, I think, as a people to, to limit the exposure that we have. But at the same time, we want to stay connected, right? It's not healthy for us as a group of people in a society to be completely self-isolated. Uh, for those that do not know, uh, I've been pausing my Uber and Lyft rides that I've given in the community since the outbreak kind of uh, went full scale in the social distancing uh, situation, the face mask situation, the hand washing situation should have been kind of done, in my opinion, to begin with. Um, the flu is still a real threat to folks that are compromised anyway, but uh, being in a car with someone can be a little bit more uh, close than, than you would have liked. But I recently restarted that process. You know, I have a face mask, I wash my hands and have hand sanitizer, and I sanitize the car with certain chemicals that will continue to kill things for 24 hours. And so I feel confident enough having the windows down to be able to give rides once again. And I drove an individual um, yesterday, or two days ago. And that person two days ago has not left their house literally in six weeks. And this is a, a young lady who is uh, kind of brought up in fear and panic by her mother and was told that they cannot leave the house or they will get ill. And uh, this person was wearing the mask and wearing gloves and not touching anything and just breathing in her own space with the windows down. And she goes, are things open? I go, well, I mean, <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? And the person was like, oh, can, I go, can I go to a restaurant? I was like, well, you can get food to go and you can eat somewhere else, but you can't go inside a restaurant right now. It's still being opened up. And I go, how, how long have you been inside? Because I haven't left the house in six weeks. We got DoorDash and we, they leave it on the door and then we spray it down and then we bring the food inside. I go, okay, well, you know, she, she kind of forgot how to have a conversation. She began the conversation. I thought she was on, on a cell phone. She says, Hi, excuse me. I go. So I waited for her to be talking to someone on her, on her phone, and it was to me. I was, you know, three feet from her, and I go, "Are you talking to me?" She goes, "Yes, sir. Uh, excuse me. Are things open?" So it's just kind of funny how you can noticeably tell people that are are struggling to make that connection because they've been disconnected for so long. And so obviously, we've all kind of come to terms with with how we want to stay connected. We're you know, participating in an online worship together. We're staying connected in that way. You're still getting a bulletin in the mail. Um, we're still that communication from your church family. But when it comes to your connection to God, that has hopefully never been severed since all this began. Because that's the real connection that we are talking about this morning, is not just how we connect with one another or our communities, or our societies, or our culture, or any of that. It's the idea of connecting to God. 
And despite where we are physically, and despite what we may face in the future when it comes to kind of reintegrate into a society after this pandemic situation, that's one connection that we can focus on and have nothing in our way except for us, that being our connection to our Heavenly Father. Uh, what I want to do this morning is go through a, a group of passages, and i got quite a hefty group, just as kind of a warning to you, of moments in which God tried to connect with mankind. And these are all probably major people that you are aware of in Scripture. They are part of the major theme of the gospel story throughout the Old and New Testament. But the focus intends to be moments when God tried to reach down from heaven, if you will, and connect with us for our good. Right? Sometimes we get calls from people that we don't really want to talk to. Not friends or family, but we have solicitors and you have robots that call us now. And sometimes when someone tries to reach out to contact you, you may not want to be connected to that person. Right? Well, when God has reached down to connect with his people, these are significant moments in time where we in turn also want to reach up and connect to him in turn. So let's begin at the beginning. It's kind of a Bible pun. I kind of have to give it, right? So Genesis chapter 26 and verse 24. Now I, I would begin with Abraham because he is kind of the first one that we really see a, a dramatic version of God calling Abram, right? When he is in the land of Haran, he was told to, left the, uh, to leave the Ur of Chaldees, where his family and his possessions and his wealth and his, his protection was from the physical world. And he was told to go to a land that he has never seen before. And so God called to him and told him to go to that land. That was God establishing an individual through, through whom he would bless the world, right? He would bless him physically by having many children, have a nation come from this elderly man, Abram, but also bless the world because through him, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one would be born and bless all nations, not just the Israelite nation. But I want to kind of skip that now that I talked about it for about two minutes and go to Isaac because Isaac does not get the attention I think he deserves. Uh, there's not a whole lot that Isaac does when it comes to uh, being written about in scripture that's significant to us. Uh, he learned from his father's example to be fearful of kings. Uh, so he lies about his wife, which is you know him repeating the same mistake that uh, Abram did earlier. But significantly, the Lord reaches down, or at least reaches out, and tries to connect with Isaac in the same kind of way he did with Abram. So Genesis chapter 26, I'll just read verse 24. And the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you, and I will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. Now, again, this is just a, the repetition of the same promise that Abram received, but the fact that God himself tries to reach out and to comfort Isaac in a time of fear and doubt to say, I am going to keep the promise that I made to your father. And by that promise, you were born. And I'm going to keep that seed line going for the sake of the promise that I made for Abraham. That's a great comfort to know that God cared enough, not just for Abraham, but also for Isaac and for Jacob to keep that promise line going of blessing them, being with them, and because of that, they shouldn't be afraid. A major theme of Scripture is God trying to, to calm the fear and the doubt that could impact his servants. So if we jump forward just a little bit more into chapter 28 of Genesis, you see that Jacob here is fleeing from Esau. I did a series on Jacob, and I entitled it The Messy Life, right? Because you can't look at that story and just say, well, that was a good servant of God. He kept his word. He never lied. He never cheated. He never stole anything. No, he had a very messy life and made some significant mistakes. 
And uh, after he was finally humbled, he became the prince of God, or Israel. But before that, he had some issues, right? So in Genesis chapter 28, let's begin reading in verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran, which is interesting to us because that's exactly where Abraham's family was from, right? And so in a way, Jacob is forsaking the promise that God made to Abram, or to Abraham, and now he's going back to the place of the world, if you will. He came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. You know, we all know how comforting or comfortable a stone is to use for a pillow. Uh, taking, uh, keep going here, and he dreamed and behold, there was a ladder or staircase, depending on what Hebrew translation you're looking at, set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. So, of course, Led Zeppelin comes to mind. Uh, as normal Bible scholars think about the stairway to heaven, you think about Led Zeppelin, right? Just natural. We learn about it in Hebrew class. No, it's a, it's a joke. <laughs> Not a good one, but it's still a joke. Okay, and the behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, meaning your forefather, and of the God of Isaac, your physical father. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, let's keep reading here. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. Well, how interesting is that response, right? He was sleeping that night, had a vision in a dream form. Sometimes uh, people receive these visions through a dream or through just a literal vision when they're in a spiritual trance, we would say. Uh, but this time he was asleep, right? The words that God chose to use here, that he is identifying who he is as the Lord of Abram and of Isaac, and then he reiterates the land promise of the land of Canaan shall be theirs for Israel, and that he is going to multiply them and have a great nation that will bless the entire earth eventually, and that God will bring him back to this location to fulfill that promise, but I love the very end here because the Lord didn't have to reiterate this, but he did for a reason. At the very end of the promise, it says, because or for, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Now, that phraseology comes to my mind specifically in this case because we have a little girl, right? We have a little three-year-old daughter, as many of you are very full aware. And sometimes when you take her to a new environment or do something new, there is that hesitancy because she's unfamiliar with it. And there's fear because she's never experienced that thing before. For example, uh, we've been going on walks since this whole thing started a bit more regularly. We've gone and see the, the tadpoles in the pond, and there's thousands of them, and then one day they're just all gone, right? So we're going on walks, and... Uh, she's holding her hand while we're pushing the stroller with Luke in it, and, and it's, it's all good and fun, but sometimes she'll do something when we're out there that she's uncomfortable with, but knowing that we are there with her gives her that confidence to, to do that thing. So carrying her on my shoulders while she smacks the leaves on the trees, right? The, the first time I put her on my shoulders while we're walking around the neighborhood, she was unsure until she knew I was holding her legs. Then she was comfortable. Uh, the idea of going close to the water and not falling in. Well, as long as I've got her hand, she's not going to fall in. So anyway, I think about that because the language reminds me of the Heavenly Father reaching down to Jacob, who's made some serious mistakes so far in his journey with God, 
And the Lord saying, listen, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to be with you wherever you go. I'm going to fulfill my promise. And that comfort to bridge and make that connection is such a strong theme here for all these very important people in the Word of God. Let's jump forward a lot here to the book of Joshua. This is one of my favorite passages to kind of remind myself of this theme of the Lord making connection, and through that connection we have certain blessings. This is a major, major one for me. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, let's begin reading in verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, now arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving them to the people of Israel. Now, it's a big moment, right? Moses could not cross the Jordan River and go and bring the people on the conquest of Canaan. But Joshua was the man for that job. He has been learning from Moses, learning from God, learning from, no doubt, Aaron and Miriam as well as they were going from Egypt to this location, all the things that they would have to do to be prepared to go. And Joshua was the guy for that mission. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. So you already see the language here. Is trying to reinforce the, the fact that he already knew the Lord has already given you the victory for the battles you have not yet fought, which, I mean, that sentence alone has a whole lot of meaning for us, right? There are battles in front of us that we don't even know we're going to have to fight, but if we're faithful to God, we're going to overcome any of those battles, right? And that's the whole theme of, of the book of Joshua. From the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. And then here is that phrase of comfort and connection. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. And that last little sentence there is such the, the, the key of the core of what I'm trying to drive home is when God reaches out and makes that connection to mankind, He wants that relationship to build and to grow, but He wants it to grow on the foundation of the knowledge. The Lord's not going anywhere. And that's the key of how you can build trust with God himself. Now, let's jump forward a whole lot to the book of Jeremiah. Difficult for me to jump from Joshua to Jeremiah because so much happens in between. Uh, I'm going to have to assume you know a little bit about the events of the life of Israel, but long story short, I guess, Israel has forsaken the Lord. The Lord has not forsaken them, but Israel has forsaken the Lord. He, they severed that connection to their source of blessing, and that relationship is being damaged. Joshua, I'm sorry, Jeremiah rather, is a prophet of God, much like Elijah or Elisha in our studies before on Thursdays. Um, and he is someone who is needing to be the person that God needs him to be, in the fact that he needs to speak to the people from the Lord a message they don't want to hear. And so to be able to prepare him for that mission, he gives, uh, God gives Jeremiah some words of comfort. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, so he's retelling the event that took place that began his mission. The Lord says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. I mentioned before what a great comfort it is to know that anything that we do in life, the Lord already knows about. He's already seen us through it, right? Now, to some people, when you look at the idea of the word predestination, it can be scary and it can seem threatening because it would seem that our actions make no consequence to what the Lord has already preordained. 
that's not the full scope of what predestination is all about. It's the idea of foreknowledge with our free will also involved. And what that really means is the Lord knows what decisions we've made or haven't made, but we are still in control of those decisions, right? The Lord doesn't force us against our will to do anything. He's given us all the free will to either learn from him and be blessed by it or to choose not to. And so the Lord here is trying to encourage Jeremiah by saying, listen, I know all about you. I know you before you are even you when it comes to time. And I know that you are destined to be a prophet to the nations. And then Jeremiah says, Ah, Lord, behold, I don't know how to speak. I'm only a youth. <laughs> so the Lord just said, Before you were born, I knew who you were. And he says, No, my excuse is going to be, I'm too young. Well, we'll see how that pans out. The Lord says to, uh, said to me, Do not say, I'm only a youth, because to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, and here's the key, for because I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. So he's saying, I'm too young to know how to go and speak well. He goes, I'm going to give you the words to speak. Just know that I'm with you. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17 it says, But you dress yourself for work, arise, and say to them everything that I command you. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. So if you give in to fear, the Lord can't save you from that fear. He's going to give you over to that fear. And behold, I make you this day a fortified or strong city, an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. Now, if you weren't intimidated before, Jeremiah, just so you know, the Lord has to make you a strong city to go against, and here's the folks that will be against your preaching, the kings of Judah, the officials, the entire priesthood, and all the people of the land. Don't be afraid, because the Lord is with you. You see that kind of connection, that dichotomy there. When the Lord is on your side, there is no one on earth that you should be afraid of. That's a great ideal to strive towards. It says, they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you because I am with you, declares the Lord to deliver you. So you see the theme here, that God is in opportune moments throughout history reaching down and reaching out to connect with his people to give them the strength that they need to overcome the battle right in front of them. To Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, to Joshua, to Jeremiah, and all the prophets, the Lord is establishing that connection to give them that strength that they need. Talk about a prophet who had a hard time in life. Isaiah chapter 41, for example. Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah knows that Israel is going to be destroyed. The people to whom he is preaching and teaching, they are not going to survive the Assyrian Empire. Isaiah 41 and verse 8. Isaiah preaches this word to the people. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corner, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off, do not be afraid, because I am with you. Do not be dismayed, because I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now this is a, a different layer here, because the word that Isaiah is giving to this nation, they've not suffered anything yet. They haven't. They're in peace right now. They think that they have control of the situation that they find themselves in. 
But the destruction is going to be coming because they will choose to not repent of the great sins of idolatry, to name just one, in Israel. And so we look at the nation of Israel, or the, the nation of Jacob, if you will, he's reiterating the promise that he made to Jacob before he was called Israel to the nation of Jacob to give them that same strength that they need to overcome this captivity to Assyria. And so you see the kind of layers that form here. You go from just one person to his child to his child to the nation that came from them, and then generation later, you see all these different blessings that still continue because the Lord is still there. Uh, let's jump forward here to the book of Psalms. Specifically, Psalm 139. I will also reference, if you need more material to study on your own, um, Psalm 73 would be a great one to look at with this kind of thought in mind. But we're going to jump forward to Psalm 139, and I'll begin reading in verse 7. The psalm reads, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If my, I make my bed in Sheol, or the grave, or the pit, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, because darkness is as light with you. Because you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake, and here is how the psalm concludes, and I am still with you. The theme of God reaching down to make that connection is just one direction. When we reach up to our Father and establish that connection and build on that relationship, that's what we see here in Psalm 139. What you don't see is fear and doubt and oppression from enemies. What you see is the word content is the only one that I can think of that might adequately describe the emotion in those verses you see that someone is resting in God, no matter where they may be, they know that they're going to be all right. And that's the kind of connection that we need with God, that no matter what happens to us, no matter where we are, if we're in the, the uttermost darkness of the pit, the light of God is still there with us. Because we are with Him and He is with us. Now, let's go to John chapter 17. We have two more passages here. And then we'll close our thoughts out for the morning. John chapter 17. Jesus is God in the flesh. If we want to give you a spoiler, if you don't know about the deity of Christ already, then you should know that He is deity. He is God. And so when you see Jesus speaking to His followers, His disciples, you see God making that connection with people. Like we've seen consistently throughout this entire text thus far, it's just more in a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship now through the person that Jesus was. So in John chapter 17, let's begin reading in verse 14. He is speaking to his disciples, and he knows the mission that they will have in life is not going to be an easy one, nor should our lives be easy if we do what the Word of God tells us to do, right? That's why we need that strength, that encouragement, that connection to God, because... 
things should be a little bit difficult. The world's going to resist the word of God. So John 17, 14, Jesus says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of or from the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. So that's when they, when they transform between the disciples of Christ to the apostles or apostles, rather, the ones that are sent, literally, from Christ. Uh, And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they may also be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, so these disciples that have just become apostles, only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, which is, by the way, if you go down the chain of, of line, that's us as well. That they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly or completely one, that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. That's one of the prayers from Christ. It's sometimes called the the high priest prayer from the Lord because he is praying for the unity of not just the disciples or the apostles, but for everyone who's in Christ and also in God. That, That unity is the main theme. And that unity, that connection gives strength. Our last passage this morning is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14. If you're looking for the blessing that we have in Christ by establishing and and being uh, reciprocal with that connection the Lord wants to give us, this is the blessing that we get through Christ. Hebrews 4.14 Seeing then that we have a great high priest, talking about the Lord Christ, who has passed Through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Because we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted like us, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that that we may receive mercy and find grace to help and time of need. The overall theme of God reaching down and establishing that connection is to encourage them, to comfort them, and to remind them, I am with you. Don't be afraid. And when we look up at the heavens today to look at our relationship with God through Christ, we should know the same blessing is benefited to us as well. And so again, simple message, a lot of passages here overall theme being we understand when we lose connection with one another we feel weakened we feel dark we feel depressed we feel left out when we lose our connection to god we're losing a whole lot more because the blessings are that much more um, beneficial to us when it comes to the lord let's bow our heads in prayer Father, we come to you now through prayer, and we are so very thankful for the opportunity to communicate with you, to no matter where we are or what is going on in our lives or in the world, that we can have access to your throne room, that we can communicate with you, that you can give us the strength that we need, that you will uphold us, and we thank you so much, Father, for the resounding message that you are with us no matter what. We know that we're not alone, Father. We have our church family here to connect us, but we have, most importantly, that connection that you've made with with us to you. 
that we are connected through your Son, and that you've allowed us the opportunity to have this source of strength right next to us no matter what is going on. We're so very thankful. As we are continuing in our thoughts, let us go forward this week and think about that connection to give us that strength, to allow us the blessings of knowing that you are with us and that you're going to fight our battles for us, Father. Thank you for this opportunity to come to you in prayer once again. And we pray in your Son's name. Amen.